Hey, this is Harvey Doc. I'm a professional referee, and I'm a fan of Ringside Boxing Show. Live from Monterey on California's beautiful Central Coast, this is the Ringside Boxing Show. I'm Dennis Taylor, welcoming you to join me and my expert analyst, Travis Hartman, Rizwan Zahid, and John J. Rispati, today and every week for the hottest, sweatiest show on the West Coast. And now, from Studio 1A, it's the Ringside Boxing Show. Welcome to the Ringside Boxing Show on the Grueling Truth Sports Network. I'm Dennis Taylor, and we got a fascinating show coming at you today. Uh, very shortly, John J. Responti and I are going to be talking to Sugar Ray Seals, who was the only uh, boxing gold medalist for America at the 1972 Olympics in Munich. For those who are too young to uh, remember, uh, or um, uh, well, th- those were the Olympics that were uh, invaded by Palestinian terrorists who took 11 Israeli uh, athletes hostage. Uh, they were trying to get about 200 of their brethren released from prisons in Israel. Uh, the terrorists murdered all of those Israeli athletes. German police killed all the terrorists. Uh, Jim McKay, Howard Cosell, Chris Schenkel, and Frank Gifford. Um, Peter Jennings covered the whole thing live on ABC uh, TV, and it was re- truly an astounding event, uh, an event that anybody is, who, who is of that age uh, is going to remember. Sugar Ray Seals um, was, of course, in the Olympic Village when all that went down, and in a little while we're going to find out what that was like. Um, we're also going to talk to him about his life and his career, including his three fights with Marvin Hagler. Um, Paul McLaughlin, our British McC- uh, correspondent, is in Dubai this week, so we don't have a re- report from him. But we'll lead it off, as always, uh, by unpacking the week in boxing with our expert analyst. Travis Hartman is a professional boxer, uh, trainer, and promoter from Osborne, Missouri. He's now living and training in Orlando, Florida. Rizwan Zahid, a boxing journalist from Toronto. John J. Responti's chief lead writer for MaxBoxing.com and DoghouseBoxing.com. And John and I are co-authors of Intimate Warfare, the true story of the Arturo Gatti and Mickey Ward boxing trilogy, which was an Amazon bestseller. And, uh, John, I'm going to start with you today. Um, because you were ringside last night at Cash Creek Casino uh, here in Brooks, California, to watch Joel Diaz Jr., who was 23-0 and until he ran into a big punch from the Rougarou, uh, Regis Progre, in June of 2017. Uh, Joel uh, ended his 17-month layoff Saturday night with his new trainer, Max Garcia, from Garcia Boxing. Um, that was a scheduled eight-rounder against Miguel Angel Huerta, um, and it lasted two minutes and 46 seconds. You didn't get to see much, but um, you, what you saw must have been pretty impressive, John. What would you think of Joel? One word, Dennis, power. Yeah. You know, he, he he hit Huerta with a left hook, and down he went, right on the seat of his pants. It was like he shot. And uh, you, that's the great equalizer of boxing. You know, I really admire guys who don't have power, like, say, a Pauli Malignaggi, who end up being a two-time world champion. But when you got that power, you can change a, a fight so quickly. And, and, and there was nothing like that going on. He, was, he wasn't dominating the first round. He was winning the first round. He was jabbing a little more. He was trying to stay calm. But um, as Max Garcia told me after, they, they said he was nervous. And, you know, that's a long time to be off, 17 Yeah. Years. <laughs> but uh, he, just, he just threw a really crisp left hook, and, and that was pretty much it. And, When Huerta got up, you knew it was over because he was staggering. So um, they were a little disappointed because they wanted more rounds. But what are you going to do? You know, you clip a guy perfect on the chin, and he goes down, and he barely gets up, and then you pummel him, and that's it. Um, That's that's the end of it. But uh, I thought it was impressive. Um, He wanted to return with a bang, like I said in my article, and he did. So, But, of course, he wanted to do it maybe in three rounds instead of one or something. But... Hey, the win was a win, and it, it, it didn't exactly shock. The only thing that shocked was the suddenness of it, just because the first round, like I said, was going along, and then boom, he hit him with the left hook, and that was it. But, you know, good comeback for Joel. He's got a lot of skills, and uh, it's going to be fascinating to watch him go. The Rougarou, I'm sure, I, hope, I would imagine he's tried to forget that, like he told us on the show. Pretty yeah. much forgot it, but... Uh, moving up to the junior welterweight division like he did to face the Rougarou, maybe not the smartest thing in the world, but uh, with with the Garcias, working with Max and Kathy and Sam, he's going to get some real good work on his technique and everything, and 
because, again, as Max told me, you know, he was in a lot of brawls early in his career, and he just needs to work on his defense some. And, and we'll see in the next fight, I would assume. But uh, still, great, a great, a great uh, return for Joel. Defense is, is Max Garcia's. Uh, uh, yes. Uh, yeah, that's his wheelhouse. So that's what he teaches. Forte, so that, yeah. that should help him a lot. And and yeah. uh, he Joel is now twenty four and one, and he's got twenty knockouts. So that says a little something about his power. Um, Ryan Borland yeah. also won, and you said that was a, a real good fight. And uh, they also had a nice tribute to Don Chargan last night. Uh, talk to us about some of that. Yeah, Ryan Borland is is a soft spoken, uh, gentle guy in a lot of ways. He he doesn't say much. To get a quote out of him is a challenge, but uh, he he's one of those guys that just gives it his all in every fight. I've seen probably six or seven of his fights. They're never boring. I think he probably uh, w- was born that way. He's never in anything boring as far as fighting goes. He just he he lays it on the line. Every fight is tough. Doesn't matter who he's fighting. Even if the guy, if you look at the guy's record and it's not very good, it's always hard for him. But he manages to win. He's only lost twice at eighteen fights. This was a rematch against Jose Hernandez, who was really ready. So what, what it was was give and take for 10 rounds. I scored at a draw, actually, at ringside. Two judges had uh, Ryan winning, and, and uh, my friend Kermit Bayless also had it a draw. So it was one of those fights, but it was really a good fight. The crowd was roaring the whole time, sell out. And um, that, it, was, it was wonderful. Now the tribute to Don Chargan was tough because – you know, Dennis, you and me and, and the older boxing people, maybe even a few of the young ones, really loved the man. He was such a gentle soul, sweet man, accepted everybody as they were. Fighters loved him. So they, Bill, Bill Kaplan, his friend of, I think, close to 60 years, said some things, or no, actually 50-some years, uh, which was really hard for Bill. He, he barely made it through. He just said that, Don was a wonderful human being, which, of course, was true, and he'll be missed by everyone, which, of course, is also very true. And then Don loved Frank Sinatra, so here came my way by Sinatra, and then some really beautiful pictures put together by Paco Damien, the co-promoter's uh, wife, Alyssa, and it was, it, was, it was hard, but it was very beautiful, you know, and sad and all that stuff. But a real, a real uh, tribute to Don. They did the 10, the 10 count. And he deserved it. Uh, he deserves more, actually. And I, I think he's going to get more later in the month. They're going to have a memorial for him. But just one of those people, Dennis, that and Riz, you know, you can't replace them. They're one of those people. Yeah, we, we lived so many years, and 90 years is a long time. But he was just such a decent man that you just don't find many like that in this world, especially in boxing. So we're going to miss him forever. I know I am. Every time I saw him was a great experience. And uh, just a fantastic person. Yeah, we we overuse that uh, that living legend phrase, but uh, that really applies yeah. to Don Chargan. So yes, um, Riz, you watched the the Dazen show uh, from Chicago last night, and uh, that had a lot of action. And in the, in the three main fights, we saw a majority draw and two knockouts. One of the KOs came from 317 pound Jarrell Big Baby Miller, who outweighed. Thomas Adamek by more than 90 pounds and demolished him in two rounds. The other one was a fourth round TKO for Arthur uh, Betterbiev over Callum Johnson in a fight where both fighters were on the canvas in the first two rounds. So that's interesting. And then the draw came in the main event with Jesse Vargas and Thomas Delorme, and they traded knockdowns. So uh, spectators got a lot of bang for their buck, so to speak, even though a couple of the fights were short ones. Um, what kind of grade do you give Eddie Hearn for this uh, this Dayton event? I mean, because I think this was just the first event, and it, was a, um, it wasn't even meant to be a big card. I think they did a great job because – you're, not every card is going to be massive. Not every card is going to have, you know, the biggest fight possible. But um, sometimes people just want to see, uh, like, how many times do we go through lulls in boxing where there's no kind of decent fight or no noble fight for, like, three weeks? And then we're kind of just happy anytime there's a decent, you know, some sort of decent card or a decent fighter to be shown. Uh, the better be Caleb Johnson fight was a war. Um, better be, uh, you know, for a guy who's, He's kind of been on the shelf for a long time. He's kind of been, um, you know, Yvonne Michel, we've talked about this over the last couple of years. He's definitely lost control of the of the game a little bit. I think he always thought he had it. Um, I think he took the Quebec scene for granted and thought that he would always be able to put up decent fights, but that's not the case anymore. Um, 
so better we've gone to litigation with him. But I think uh, him being on the shelf, I mean, he was he was really reckless last night, though. Just you know, things he didn't kind of need to do. He had Kalen Johnson hurt, and he couldn't. And Kalen Johnson was doing really well. He was landing some really good shots already. Um, totally different power levels. Um, and then better be was decided, okay, you know, I, I should probably be a little more intelligent when he got dropped. Um, but I, I think there, there's a little work to be done, um, you know, from uh, from the production side a little bit. I mean, I think I was watching the Sky Sports version, though, and they mentioned that better be was the first time he was dropped, which it wasn't. He was dropped against Jeff Page a few years ago. Um, and in very similar fights. I mean, he, he had his guy hurt, and he got a little reckless, so... Uh, but it'll be, you know, people want to see better beef against, you know, the big guys, Bivol and, you know, uh, Kovlev and, and uh, he, I, him and Eladi Alvarez, I believe, train together and have the same trainer. So I don't think they're going to they're going to be fighting anytime soon. Um, Jarrell Miller, you know, uh, arguably, I'd say outside of Wilder, probably the most notable American heavyweight. I know that doesn't necessarily say a lot, um, but I think a, a, a guy people like, I, I think, um, I don't think people necessarily dislike Wilder. I just think it's really hard to dislike uh, Jarrell Miller and uh, for a guy who's 320 pounds man he can move and that I you know usually when you see guys come in that weight you're just like oh why is he weighing so heavy I mean he's definitely way more in shape than a lot of you know than a lot of fighters I see who are 230 240 pounds so it's not just um, it's not just weight he definitely he's built like a football player and just, uh, I'd be shocked if he didn't have a background in that uh, he was a kickboxer before he got into um, before he got into boxing and yet you put on weight since his previous fight. So, and the funny thing is, though, he looked at he looked in better shape. That's that's the funniest thing. I was I was I was looking at the weigh-in, and Adamic is a ninety pounds lighter, and Adamic to me looked more out of shape than he did in previous uh, his previous fight. So it's funny that the guy who's a hundred pounds heavier looks in better shape. And I think that's just kind of his body type because, um, you know, against Duapaz he slowed down a little towards the end, but that's also because he's throwing sixty seventy punches around which is well above the heavyweight norm. Um, but I think the big drawback is we haven't really seen Jerome Miller against anyone with the pulse yet. And, right, you know, right. he's, he's definitely made, he's definitely made the transition, um, the transition from, uh, you know, a guy who's not background, wasn't boxing to becoming a pro. Some guys don't do it really well because he had a combat sport background. I think he understands the fundamentals, but he also has zero head movement. And I think when he's fighting, you know, a Joshua or Wilder, I think it's going to be a, you know, a totally different scenario. But I do want to see him against someone who's kind of been there. I mean, like even, a, you know, a Dillian White, I think, is a, is a great fight. I think um, a Chisora or a, um, I think a Joseph Parker, I think, is a good fight for him. Um, at least, I mean, Dillian White might not be in a rush because Dillian White is probably the backup for Joshua if the Wilder fight doesn't come about. Um, but I don't see a reason, like Joseph Parker kind of, you know, he went from at least a titleist to kind of nothing now. So uh, maybe a fight in the States with against Jerome Miller would be kind of a, a good for both guys, I think. I, but I think Jerome Miller kind of needs one of those fights now because there's no way, you know, I, I, I'll be honest. I saw Jerome Miller earn his career and I saw his record and I saw who the hell is this out of shape guy, like thinking he can make it as a heavyweight fighter. Are you kidding me? And now I've watched him. Uh, I'm, I'm not saying he's going to, you know, I'm not saying he's going to beat Wilder or Joshua, but I'll say that he's gotten much, much better as, as he's uh, progressed in his career. And I think arguably the way the division has now shaped, he is probably, you know, the fifth guy arguably in that division after Wilder and Joshua and Fury and, uh, and maybe like a Dillian White or something like that. So there's, um, you know, there's, he is the guy I think to be, to be there next. And I do want to see him fight someone with, with a pulse before he gets to those two bigger fights. I mean, I understand why those fights are not happening yet. Those guys are kind of circling each other, Joshua and Wilder, that is. But there's no reason for Jerome to kind of fight anyone else at this point. I think this is this is what he is, and I'd rather see him fight someone who at least has some experience against Joshua or Wilder rather than a guy like Adamic, who's, whose best experience as a heavyweight was long before Joshua and Wilder came about. Uh, you got to remember, Adamic's loss wasn't, you know, big heavyweight loss was it against Vladimir Klitschko, against Vitaly Klitschko. So we're going back a good... I think six years, I think it was 2011 when he lost. So, and he got dominated Then he hasn't really been anything since. And if that's Jerome Miller's biggest win, then that's kind of a problem. So I'm hoping we see him against uh, someone with a pulse soon. Um, and I think that the zone, um, the zone broadcast, I think overall was, was quite solid. And, uh, you know, it'll be, it'll be even better when they actually put on real, 
like bigger cars. I mean, this was just a good local showcase kind of car that has some guys with experience and guys who, who've been at the top and like familiar names, but um, you know, Jesse Vargas is a guy who's been there and uh, DeLorme is a guy who's kind of been on some HBO cards, but once they actually put on, you know, major title fights, I think they'll be even better. I mean, for, for, I, I think what, what they've done really well is they understood that with, you know, considering they don't have to buy broadcast time necessarily, they can show four or five fights, no problem. And I think that's, that's where, um, you know, uh, Golden Boy started in a couple of years ago when they were kind of on the up. Uh, they kind of copied the UFC format um, because it keeps, it keeps, uh, it keeps, con- you know, customers and viewers engaged for, for multiple hours. And I think that's what the zone's kind of aiming for. They understand that they don't need to just have a double header. They can put on five, six fights because they understand that sometimes fighter fights just turn into stinkers. Sometimes there's headbutts, whatever the case, but if you put four or five fights, you're going to get your value and entertainment out of it. So because of that, I think they're, I think their format is great. Um, and I'm looking forward to see what they do for the next one, but they're off to a great start. I mean, they invested a billion dollars and, uh, to be honest, uh, if you're putting, if you're putting a billion dollars into something, you better be doing a damn good job. So they're off to a good start. Um, John, you didn't get to see that Dazen card, but, um, uh, Jesse Vargas to me is kind of a hard guy to figure. Um, he, he was good enough to give Tim Bradley everything he wanted three years ago in that interim world title bout when he was 26 years old, lost a really competitive de- decision. Uh, 2016, he took on Manny Pacquiao and went the distance, 12 rounds in a WBO title fight. Pacquiao won a unanimous decision, but Dave Moretti, one of the judges, thought it was a one-point fight. Um, then he fights Adrian Broner. That's a majority draw. And now Vargas Delorme, um, and, and I would have thought he would have won that fight, but uh, he, it ends in a draw. Th- this guy is like eight or nine rounds in those four fights from being 31-1 and one or 32-0 and 0 right now. He, he's kind of becoming the, the king of the near miss, and I guess that's one of the cruel realities of boxing, isn't it? Yeah, you know what? You know what? The first thing that popped in my head when I saw it, Dennis, was all the grueling fights this guy has been in. You know, he's yeah. been, he he he's been in some hard fights. I mean, we were just talking about Ryan Borland. Jesse Vargas is another guy who's never in a boring fight, and and he 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 he, he takes a lot of shots, and it it concerns me. He's a young guy, and as Ad, Andy Nance was telling me last night, he he used boxers. He used the symbolism. Uh, a, a boxer being like a tree, you know, and you've got all these guys chopping at you, and one of these days they're going to hit the right spot, and you, you're just going to go timber. And, oh. and that's true, you know. I mean, it just, when you're in so many grueling fights, uh, it catches up with you, and that's what I thought. I, I agree with you. I thought I was surprised when I saw the, uh, the draw. I thought he would win that fight. I, I didn't have any doubt that he would win that fight. Yeah. Styles are everything as we know, you know, as Travis has explained to us so many times, and we know uh, it's all about styles. But I don't know. I was I was really surprised. But then again, like I said, taking a different angle, I thought, God, this guy, he's in so many hard fights. He's, he, it's got to start wearing on him. And I, I haven't seen DeLone fight very much, but maybe, maybe it was, maybe he had an off night last night. Maybe there was something else, but I was I was surprised by that. But yeah, he is the king of the near miss. You're right, but it could be the other way too. You know, he, he the, the the fight with Bradley, he was losing that fight all the way, and then he almost stopped him. Right, but almost you know only good in uh, what horseshoes. So uh, he 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 he's I think he's he's good, but he's not good enough to beat the really top guys. So I think that's why he loses to them. But if he fights guys that are good like him. Or maybe a little blow him, he beats him. But uh, maybe this theory was a little messed up last night. So he's kind of an enigma. But as I said, he, you know, he was working with Roy Jones a few years ago, Dennis. And the pure re- the, the, the reason was to work on his defense. You know, we were just talking about Joel Diaz. Try to box a little bit more and not take so much punishment. And I remember that fight. He looked real good. But then as the fight went on, he started to get hit with shots and tagged. And, and you, you, you revert to what you know. And now he just fights the way he does. Again, always in exciting fights, near the top of the division. But uh, I, he, I don't think he's going to get any better at this age. So uh, he, he, he needs to figure out wh- what he wants to do. I would bet you if he was on our show right now and we asked him, well, did that surprise you last night? I bet you he'd say yes. I don't think he expected mm-hmm. to be knocked down. 
You know, I don't think that. So he's he's in a kind of a funny spot right now in his career. I I I would I would do some soul searching if I was him and try to figure out where to go go from here. There was a, a surprise announcement on Friday from Eddie Hearn um, about Canelo Alvarez on December fifteenth. He's going to jump to 168 pounds and fight for the uh, WBA Super Middleweight Championship against the the current title holder Rocky Fielding, who's a, a 31 year old Brit with a 27 and one record, 15 knockouts. Um, the blemish on Fielding's record is a first round TKO against Callum Smith. That was in November of 2015. Fielding was down three times in that fight, uh, which ended in two minutes and 45 seconds. Um, Riz, we're we're hearing a lot of hot air from Golden Boy uh, about Canelo versus David Lemieux. I didn't believe that. You kind of did. Um, Travis didn't think Canelo would fight at all in December. Um, Also, you know, they threw out Canelo versus Jamal Charlo. None of us believe that. So um, this, I guess, was a curveball. Does Rocky Fielding look like a hanging curve for Canelo, or is he any kind of threat at all? I don't think he's much of a threat. I mean, I don't think they would be. Uh, they're not stupid. They wouldn't jump into a Saturday or a um, or a, a fight in, in December just a couple months after after fighting Golovkin unless they right. they were very confident they were going to win. Um, and I think obviously the higher weight is also because so Canelo doesn't have to shed any weight. Um, exactly. And I think the other thing you have to remember is, like I said, I think this was the biggest reason uh, HBO's contract's done, and I think they're shopping around. I think they're. He's a free agent. This is a showcase. They want to see how um, how the zone is going to handle um, how the zone's going to handle Canelo. How are they going to um, you know are they going to have kind of full features on him? What are the numbers going to be like and all that? And they don't want to risk a high level opponent to do something like that. So it's it's kind of a showcase. Um, you know, for for Fielding, it's, it's obviously a great opportunity. His only loss was Callum Smith, who's a solid power puncher who now fights as a light heavyweight. Um, so I, I, I mean, you know, he got knocked out, but he got he got knocked out against a guy who's who's definitely a bigger fighter. Um, but you know, so I I think he's going to think he has a chance here. It'll be interesting to see how Canelo's power carries up because I don't think his power's really carried up all that well over the last you know couple of years. I mean, obviously Golovkin's a Golovkin's an animal. He he he's always been able to take a good shot. Uh, we never seen him flinch even. But um, we also saw. You know, there's a, he wasn't able to kind of knock out Miguel Cotto, which surprised a lot of people. Um, you know, there's yeah, he knocked out Amir Khan, but at that division, that was not a surprise. Um, so it'll be interesting to see how he how he kind of handles uh, the extra weight and size and and everything else. But I, I don't think anyone expecting this to be a permanent change. I'm what I'm really surprised at actually is that it's not a catchweight fight. And I don't know if um, Rocky Fielding just put his foot down and said no, I'm not cutting any extra weight. But I was shocked to see it's not at like 165 or or something like that. So uh, it would be interesting. Yeah, I, I think the biggest reason for this happening, though, is not for Canelo to, you know, he's going to say, yes, I want to fight for my fans, yada, yada. That's just a PR spin. The reality is I think they just, A, they need to get him uh, in the, and, you know, get him out there a little bit and have a decisive win. And uh, I think in addition to that, I think the whole point is just to kind of shop around and see where um, where he's going to go next. Because Golden Boy is almost, I mean, I think it's, I think that's pretty much that's pretty much all they have left. So and I mean it, you know Delhi has got to be very thankful that Canelo's uh, they definitely have more than just a promoter fighter relationship. They're definitely you know you can tell they're pretty good friends. Um, so Delhi in some ways almost acting as a manager rather than a promoter. Um, but I, they're clearly looking for a partner, and I don't think they're going to go to ESPN, even though ESPN is probably. Uh, the best option, I think, for him, you know, obviously with America's proximity to Mexico and ESPN Deporte, so he uh, he makes appearances on there. But we both know that that means you got to go through top rank and Barbera. And I don't think Deloy has any interest in doing that. So this is where you look at top rank and, and Barbera, and you think, man, this guy, he's, uh, he's old, but, man, is he smart because he, he saw this coming. He planned this whole thing out. So it'll yeah. be interesting to see, um, you know, Showtime's obviously an option. I think I think that's a tremendous option for obvious reasons too, because um, I, the high level amount of opponents there. I think that's going to be the issue with the zone. Like, let's say he goes with Eddie Hearn. Eddie Hearn doesn't have that much control um, over the middleweight and super middleweight divisions. And I think, in some ways, maybe that's what Delahoy and Golden Boy are looking for. Um, I think maybe they're looking for an easier path because 
let's face it, we know that if he goes to the zone, okay, we're not going to see him. We're not going to see him fight any of the Charlos. Billy Joe Saunders is with Frank Warren, so we're not going to see him. Probably not see him fight Billy Joe Saunders either. So, um, yeah. what's you know what is he going to do from here? And this is what we kind of talked about. Yeah. For Canelo, there's no there's no step backwards, right? He's kind of used all his lifelines, right? He's gotten he got a draw when he shouldn't have gotten a draw. In most people eyes. Even the win, a lot of people thought it, it should have went the other way, but it was closer. And there was obviously the you know the the positive test and everything else. Like he's he he he's he's already on strike three. Like strike three already happened, right? And he's he's lucky that they're going to extras. That's pretty much what the scenario he's in right now. So I don't think there's a step backwards. I think it's fine for December because people just want to see him fight rather than not. I think if you're fighting four times a year, yeah, you can have a couple gimmies. But when you're fighting once or twice, I don't I don't think that's possible. So. It'll be interesting to see who in, who he ends up fighting after this, um, but it, but I think all that comes down to who he ends up signing with. Because uh, as much as I like the zone, I think they're they're going the right direction. I don't think there's a lot of options for him there. And I think if he if he goes, um, you know, with PBC, I think it's the complete opposite. I think there's so many options there that every fight's going to be very difficult. And you know, you have to question is that is that what he wants? So I think with the zone, there's opportunities to fight more times a year but maybe not against kind of the best of the best. So um, this is going to be a good audition tape, and we'll, we'll be interested to see what happens. Yeah, you know, John, uh, to me, it, it looks like a, a way for Canelo not only to pick up a quick payday in December, and I didn't think he was going to fight in December, and neither did Travis, uh, but he also is going to get a, a title belt in another weight division. Uh, and and he he won't have to work very hard to make the weight. He probably won't have to work at all to make that weight, 168. Um, and and Rocky Fielding's going to beat Canelo, not bloody likely, you know. So it all makes a lot of sense when you look at it that way, doesn't it? Well, yeah. We, we were, when we were chatting on Facebook, I think I think I said he's just adding to his resume, you know, another title mm-hmm. to his resume. The titles don't mean what they once did. Here we go with the age thing again. They were there's so many of them now. So many champions, you know. You have the uh, the regular champion, and the, I mean, it's ridiculous to me. I absolutely despise it. So, if you want to add a, a title to your resume, so you can at one point in your career say you're a four-time champion, or five-time champion, or six-time champion, or eight-time champion, like Manny Pacquiao, people debated: is he an eight-time champion? Is he an eleven-time champion? And, and it, it, it it's silly, but. It does look good on the resume, so that's all I see this as. This is just, this is just a, a, a I don't know if I want to say an easy payday because I don't know that much about uh, uh, his opponent, but uh, it probably will be. I, like uh, Riz said, they're not going to risk their golden goose on a, a risky fight, obviously. So uh, th- that's all I see this as. It's just, it's just a greedy grab to get another title. I, I don't know who. They think that is important to pretty much every boxing fan I talk to agrees with me that, that and with us that these titles are a joke. So I think again I'm being re- very repetitive here. It's just to show it on your resume and say I'm a three-time champion, a four-time champion, or whatever. Get a nice amount of money, uh, win at the end of the year, build the momentum for your next fight, which will be a much bigger fight. Obviously, uh, either a fight with Golovkin, which I read. Uh, he hasn't decided if he's going to fight him again yet, and or or uh, maybe a Charlo or something like that. But uh, it, that's all it is. It, it just just more news. Stay in the news. Win explosively. I think that there's going to be uh, they're going to want him to knock him out, and uh, then say, look, you know, I'm pound for pound the best fighter. All it's all PR. It's all uh, it's all that, uh, and it's just another title. It's <laughs> it's, it's silly to me, but it works. It keeps you going, keeps your name in the press, gives you another title on your resume, so you can say, here I am, the three, like I said, be announced with all those titles, and uh, you move forward. So that's that's all I see it as. Um, uh, okay, let's, uh, the last thing for you guys, and it's kind of an unusual detour for us, but I, I wanted, and I wish Travis was here, because he last night watched UFC 229, which was... Uh, a, a friggin' circus. Uh, it, it was one of the most wildest scenes that I've ever seen. I, I watched a little bit of the replay tonight. But uh, Khabib Ner- Nurmagomedov submitted Col- Conor McGregor, um, and then all hell, break, uh, hell, all hell broke loose. Um, 
you know, there were, there were guys jumping over the over the fence. Um, uh, Khabib uh, went into the, the bleachers after some guy. Um, crazy stuff. Uh, Riz, did you get to see? Did you get to watch part of that? Yeah, I watched the whole thing. What what was what happened there? What what, what went on? Well, it seemed like um, so. Uh, Conor McGregor got in trouble earlier in the year um, when he was still without a fight book, and uh, he Khabib was uh, due to fight in the main event um, the day before, and uh, and sorry, the day after, and uh, I think the day of the weigh-in, the bus that had you know a bunch of fighters, Conor, Conor and his little posse attacked the bus, threw a couple guardrails at it, and he was kind of escorted out of the building. Um, so, uh, you know, he there's a couple of guys from that camp, I think, that, you know, that was also that their opponents was guys from Khabib's camp, and, and obviously they didn't get along. So I think all that kind of really built up from that. Um, so when Khabib won last night, um, he was he charged at one of the fighters um, from Connor's camp, and I, I think that guy said something derogatory. And there's been a lot of, obviously, bad... Uh, you know, a lot of trash talking and all that building up to the fight, but um, you know, that's not that's not unusual for MMA or boxing, right? Like, you know, there's been we've seen some bad trash talking before a fight, but you know, after a fight, that's usually pretty much it. But um, for a guy like Khabib, I don't think he really took very kindly to it, and uh, he doesn't. He's not really a trash talker. He's definitely the guy who uh, he's he just going to do his talking kind of when he fights. So, um, so it became kind of a huge melee. He went after um, Connor's cornerman. Uh, Connor uh, responded uh, when one of Khabib's corner men went to see what was going on, and I think Connor thought that he was going to join the melee. So Connor responded, and then one of Khabib's other corner men jumped in the ring, hit Connor, and then you know everything kind of broke out from there. It was uh, it was quite a, quite a scene, and all very surreal in a very short amount of time. Um, literally everything happened probably in like between 30 seconds and a minute. So it was. Uh, it was definitely shocking. Um, from what I know, funny enough, I think better be than Khabib, our friends. Or I, I know they have some. Uh, I've seen pictures of them together. They probably have trained together at some point. The Dagestan and, and mixed martial arts and boxing community is, is very is very small. Um, so I think everyone kind of knows each other. There was a Canadian Olympian boxer a couple years ago, Arthur Birslanov. I believe he's friends with both of those guys too. So he kind of knows what's going on. So, but uh, from what I've always seen about the fighters from Dagestan. They don't. They don't talk a lot. They're very. Uh, they take their craft very, very seriously. Their work ethic is almost second to none. Um, and they're. You know, a uh, funny thing is, uh, they're. They're very hospitable people. They're very, very nice people. But they're definitely kind of. They're not the kind of people you want to make angry, uh, like ever. Um, because and and I think you know I think there's obviously a line that can't be crossed for some guys. And I think for for. Khabib was, you know, anytime you're referencing culture or religion or anything like that, you know, some some fighters brush it off, but for guys who don't really talk a lot, you know, and I think we all know that it's, you know, kind of, it's what hypes up a fight, it's what people like to see, unfortunately, so it's what makes the sales, but um, I think all that kind of just built up into one massive, one massive outburst, you know, it's, uh, it's I guess it's almost like a ticking time bomb in some ways, when a guy who's known to be kind of very serious about his craft and all that, who's never had any sort of outburst ever in his career, like at all. Um, even when he was attacked on a buzz, he, he didn't even say anything. And uh, and then it kind of just, I think it just all built out right at once. So very, very surreal. Um, uh, and, you know, boxing had a couple of these before. I mean, I don't think we've had any, anything like this. I, the closest I can think of was maybe the first Boca Lada fight. When there was kind of a ride in the ring, and when Lampley famously said, "You know, I have a 16-year-old daughter who I got to look for right now," mm-hmm. um, that's probably the closest thing I can think of. But um, very surreal, and uh, it's crazy just because just when you, especially in Vegas, right when you think you've seen it all, it's just just something else. And funny enough, never seen anything like this after a fight so much, right? And, not, and nothing where the fight itself wasn't controversial. I mean, Bogota had so much controversy because of the low blows and everything, but this was. Uh, you know, right on top of the stoppage, it was everything else was fine. No, no, no shots after the bell or any of those kind of things. It wasn't. It was. It was a. Uh, it was one of those fights that had a lot of hype around it. So there was tension, but that was it, right? This was. It was interesting. It was definitely surreal, and uh, I'm sure it's rare when Boston can look at another sport and be like, "Man, those guys are crazy." So <laughs> it was interesting to see uh, 
boxing all of a sudden by default looking like uh, not as crazy as the other sport. It's rare. <laughs> Those guys are our expert analysts, Rizwan Zahid and John J. Responti. Travis couldn't be with us uh, this week. Uh, our expert analysts are straight out of the Marvel comic books when it comes to boxing. Nice. Great job again, fellas. Uh, you guys have a great week. All right. Thank you, guys. All right. Uh, we're going to take a very, pr- ve- a very brief break, and then we're going to return with uh, an amazing interview with 1972 Olympic gold medalist Sugar Ray Seals who uh, truly has a riveting story to share with us about his life and career. Um, Don't go away. We'll be right back. Hi, I'm Dennis Taylor, host of the Ringside Boxing Show, where since 2008 we have been continuously sponsored by Garcia Boxing, the first family of the sweet science on California's beautiful Central Coast. Trainers Max and Sam Garcia and ring strategist Dean Hamilton are regarded among the most knowledgeable in the game. And Kathy Garcia, who manages all Garcia boxing fighters, is renowned for her integrity and career guidance, having taken two boxers to number one world rankings. Together they comprise one of the most respected teams in the sport. Learn more by calling 831-261-3214 or send them an email at GarciaBoxing25 at AOL.com. I'm Dennis Taylor, co-author of the Amazon bestseller, Intimate Warfare, the true story of the Arturo Gatti and Mickey Ward boxing trilogy. You know, writing this book was a labor of love for John J. Responti and myself. We enjoyed every minute of the process and considered it a privilege to tell the tale of one of the most electrifying boxing trilogies in the history of this sport. Intimate Warfare traces the collision course of Arturo Gatti and Mickey Ward from their earliest days through their three epic fights as well as the aftermath of this great rivalry which culminated in one of the greatest friendships in boxing. Intimate Warfare has received a four and a half star rating from readers and was endorsed by Hall of Famers Harold Letterman and Joe Cortez and two-time trainer of the year Virgil Hunter. Our foreword was written by Ray Boom Boom Mancini, another one of the greatest blood and guts fighters of our time. Get your copy today at Amazon.com. Good afternoon. I'm Jim McKay speaking to you live at this moment from ABC headquarters just outside the Olympic Village in Munich, West Germany. The piece of what what have been called the Serene Olympics was shattered just before dawn this morning about 5 o'clock when Arab terrorists armed with submachine guns, faces blackened, a couple of them disguised as guards or as uh, trash men in the Olympic Village, climbed the fence, uh, went to the headquarters of the Israeli team and immediately killed one man. Moshe Weinberg approached, two shots in the head, one in the stomach. This is building number 31. And we're moving in now on the windows behind which, at this moment, eight or nine terrified living human beings. The Israeli hostages and the Arab commanders who have held them hostage for this entire day have now left, proceeded along a subterranean roadway underneath the Olympic Village and have gone to a makeshift helicopter pad at the back of the Olympic Village. Vance Holvig, ABC film crew over there, describes the scene as they board the helicopters and depart. Vance, will you come in? I've just gotten the final word. When I was a kid, my father used to say, our greatest hopes and our worst fears are seldom realized. Our worst fears have been realized tonight. They now said that there were 11 hostages. Two were killed in their rooms this morning, yesterday morning. Nine were killed at the airport tonight. They're all gone. Welcome back to the Ringside Boxing Show on the Grueling Truth Sports Network. I'm Dennis Taylor with John J. Responti, and today's featured guest was the only American boxer to win a gold medal at the 1972 Summer Olympics and a world title contender as a middleweight in the late 1970s and early 1980s. Sugar Ray Seals faced the likes of Ayub Kalouli, Alan Minter, and marvelous Marvin Hagler, who he faced three times during a 68-fight pro career that spanned 11 years. He is in the uh, Tacoma Pierce County Sports Hall of Fame in Washington, and earlier this year he was inducted into the inaugural class of the Indiana Boxing Hall of Fame. Ray, what a pleasure it is to talk to you on the Ringside Boxing Show. Thanks for making some time for us today. How are you, sir? I'm doing fine, but the pleasure is mine. 
Anytime I can get to talk to the people out there, it's a, it's a, it's a mighty great pleasure. The pleasure is mine. Thank you. Great to have you. Well, Ray, you and I are, are pretty much from the same generation. You were born in 1952. I was born in 1953. And one of the most unforgettable episodes in my life was watching Jim McKay and Howard Cosell and the rest of the ABC sports team cover the terrorist incident at the 1972 Summer Olympics in Munich. Um, for people who were too young to remember, uh, there were eight members of the Palestine, Palestine uh, Liberation Organization. They took 11 members of the Israeli Olympic team hostage, um, trying to get 234 Palestinian prisoners released from jail in Israel, and they ultimately murdered all the hostages. Um, it was an incident that really horrified the world. Um, were, were you in your boxing? Where were you and your boxing teammates during those three we days? Were, we were in the village, we, right? We was in the village. And uh, what happened, really, is that we opened our ears and our eyes and we saw something that we had no business seeing. You know, the Palestinian. We was there for one thing, and that's for winning the Olympic gold medal in all fields of, of, of Olympians, all yeah. fields, sports. And uh, so we had that problem. It was just a problem, minor problem for us because we didn't have nothing to do with it, except they had to postpone the Olympics for one day more. That was the only problem we had, but I was ready. Uh, did, did the village fill up with security? I mean, were the people running around with guns and to protect you guys? You know, I saw all that from the outside, out the windows, looking down in, into our apartments. We was up high in the top floor, but we saw everything going on. And our main thing was to stay out of trouble because we was away from the United States of America, so we have to stay out of trouble. So stay in your, your hotel room, and if you have to get under the bed, get under the bed because bullets don't have a name. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. Absolutely. They what, don't have a name. What, they'll, they'll just hit you. They'll come at you. They don't have a name. They don't have a direct person they're going after. Just squeeze the trigger, and the bullet comes and hits who's in the front. So we didn't want to be in the front, even though America wants to be up top because we want mm -hmm. to be known what's going on, wants to be in every, every, everybody's business at that one time. But it was wrong. But anyway, my thing was to keep my family away from the Olympic Village until we was ready to go again. We didn't know if we was going to go again, but we had to wait. So wow. one more for me, and then I'll turn it over to John. Uh, did, you, did you have a fear factor? I mean, were you nervous during that time? I was only nervous for my, my parents. I'm telling you, my mother was from there, from Tacoma, Washington, and my dad was there from the Virgin Islands. You see, so yeah, I was scared for them more than me. Yeah, yeah. You know, and that yeah, was that, that was a big that was a big thing, man. We we all of us are in a foreign country, don't know nothing about what's going on in a foreign country. So we have to stick as close as we can. I have to let my parents know that you can't come into the village today because of what's happening. But wait until I call you, and and everything was good after that. When they say one more day, everyone was happy. Because my mother and my dad knew why we was there. Did you have access to TV coverage? Did you know what was going on? No, because we were just listening to our coaches. They're okay. telling us on the telephone what's going on, what we need to do. And, and so we was on a telephone uh, conversation, back and forth, back and forth. Don't come out, stay down, watch yourself. The, we don't know if the Olympics going to go on, but we will tell you what's going on. So we'll keep your breath. So stay down and, and just relax yourself. And that's what we did. Okay. Wow. That's amazing. I'm, I was sitting there listening to you, Sugar, and I, I was trying to imagine how difficult it must have been as an athlete. With all that going on, you're worried about your parents, you're, you're waiting to hear what's going to happen, and then you're thinking about this tournament, you want to win the gold so desperately. How hard was it to focus on that tournament in wake of that tragedy? I was 19 years old when I got there, and I turned 20 on my second fight. You know, so that was pressure. Uh huh. A lot of pressure because I'm not there with my with my boxing team. I am there with family also. So that was a lot of pressure. They didn't know what to do, coming or going, and I have to make sure that they got the message from me, whether to come or to go or to stay. And that was my concern, knowing that I was going to win the Olympic gold medal anyway. That's what I went there for. 
My mother bought a plane ticket six months before I qualified because she knew. <laughs> and that's why I went there. I went there to help uh, the United States become an Olympic gold medalist. I didn't believe I'd be the only one. But I knew that I would be with. Let me give you a story. Here is a story. In February of 1972, I was almost drafted into the military, so I went and took my physical. I passed. Okay? I passed. But when I went to Munich and I won the only gold medal for America, I saved the flag. I saved the flag. So you know what? They thanked me. You don't have to go in the military. No, we thank you because you held that flag up. Well, I saved America in boxing, and boxing was the number one sport in the United States. Yeah. Boxing. Yeah. yeah. So I saved America, and even under the pressure, because there was a lot of pressure. Yeah. The pressures, the pressures, you don't know what's going to happen. We're there, and, and, and everything is cut down short now. You're not, the fight is over. There's no more finals, and what are you going to do? So yeah. there was a lot of pressure. And then for me to tell my parents what's going on and what to do, and, and don't make that move until I call you back. You know something? My trainer... Amateur trainer Joe Cloud was there also. So it was me, my mother, my father, and Joe Cloud into that gold medal. Mm. Yeah. Wow. Wow. Oh, man, what a, what a day that was. What a yeah. day. I mean, listen, it, it, it was a special day for America because we couldn't come home without a goal in boxing. But it also was a tragedy because we was there. You remember the basketball team got beat by a three-second overtime. Yeah. yeah. Never forget yeah. that one. Come on, man. The, the track team was told the wrong time to go to the track. And, and yep. when they got there, it was over. Yep. Yeah. But we came yeah. out with a couple of pluses. Uh, Mark Smith, the swimmer, he grabbed five or six or seven gold, and he left. Seven we had gold. Dan yep. Gable, our first wrestling gold medalist, Dan Gable. Yep. Yeah. Remember all of them very well. Hey, we had yeah. the best. But we had the best Olympic team in 1972. We just got ran over because we didn't pay attention to ourselves. We were looking at somewhere else. We took our eye off the the prize, and you know what, what happened? We got bombed. Yeah, you know, you mentioned that too. You were the only one to win gold, and, and Richard Carreras and Jesse Valdez and Marvin Johnson won bronze. Is yes. that kind of a disappoint? Is that kind of a disappointment? I mean, I've, you must have been figuring that you guys. I mean, you got your gold, but you must have been figuring some other teammates would get gold too, right? We thought we had the best boxing team in the business yeah. in America in 1970. We thought we had the best boxing team. Well, we did. It mm -hmm. just didn't pan out like it's supposed to. Mm -hmm. yeah. But let me tell you something else. The Olympic is the biggest and the baddest and the most important boxing. This in your life. So that means that when you go there, you've got to go ready for whatever is going to happen, and you're going to do what you went there to do. Yeah. Listen, I went to the Winter Olympic gold medal, man. And who am I? An Olympic gold medalist. Yeah. That's what I did. So when I left Tacoma, I was focused enough to go and have it, even though my mom and my dad was there, and I had a little... uh uh what do you want to call it? It's destruction. Destruction. Yeah. Yeah, because I, I'm focused on one thing, and I got to pay attention. And my mother's in the, in the audience, and she beat. I was fighting the Cubans. My mom was sitting with the Cubans in the stand, and she was fighting the Cubans also. <laughs> so I had to hit the Cuban and look out the ring and see what the hollering back and get back in there and back and forth. <laughs> you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. That's how I had it. Yeah. Sure. Sure. Yeah, that those fights we had during yeah oh yeah that's a ton of pressure during the during the Olympics. Yeah. Uh, what, you're telling us some memories, but you according to what we were reading, you won three of your five victories were close on the scorecards. Uh, is that true? I, I I don't really remember that, but I certainly remember you. But I don't remember how they close they were. What what are your memories of those fights? Those five Shit, victories. Shit, I won them all. I'm an Olympic gold medalist. Regardless of how close it was, you know, we always step to the land. We always, America, just listen, America has that staying power. Whenever we need it, it shows up. I had my mother, my father, and my coach. 
That was the power of winning the Olympic gold medal. They was there. My coach had to hitchhike to get to Munich. He had to hitchhike to get to Munich, but he got there. <laughs> and, 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 and there you go. And we needed that. That goes to show you how much stuff, what we have inside of us, what, what energy and, and that drives us, what drive we have to do that. He ran he hitchhiked to Munich, Germany. How can you do that? But he <laughs> did. But he did. And what happened? We won. Yeah. We won. We was, matter of fact, matter of fact, my family was one of the first families that was at the Munich Olympic, or the, that was an Olympic uh, uh, competition. And now after that, you see more families are taking more responsibility of their children. We got to be there because they need our support. We got to be there because, man, listen, my mother was beating up on everybody. She met Howard Cosell. She loved mm -hmm. Howard Cosell. Howard loved her back, man, because she was a go-getter. Yeah. Mm -hmm. What did you think of Howard? She was a go-getter, man. We was there together. We yeah. went to this thing to get this gold medal together, man. Today, nice. today is 46 years old. Yeah. Uh, what, my what, American Express what, are your, what are your memories of Howard Cosell, sure? I thought Howard was a great guy, man, because he, he pronounced my name right. <laughs> you know, I'm, he, and he didn't give me Ray Seals. He gave me Sugar Ray Seals. Did, so he was the one who nicknamed you? No, my name was in 1965. I got the name. So I looked like Ray Robinson back in the days. Okay. But, he, mm. but Howard Cosell, he, he put it on the, on the TV. He made everybody know that this guy here that just won an Olympic gold medal, his name is Sugar Ray Shields. Mm. Ray, what kind of a memory what, is it of you standing on top of the podium here in the national anthem realizing that you had that gold medal around your neck? Man, listen, I went there for that. My memory was with holding it, putting it on. You know what I do now? I take that gold medal and I put it on everybody's head. I said, this is what happens. I said, I give you a pitch. I said, you just won the championship fight. You're still in the ring. They, they push the podium and you step on the top row. Now, just for that one second, you become a world champ. Because when you bend down and I put that on your head and you stand up straight, all of a sudden, it just hits you for that one second. And then right behind that one second, dun, 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 the national anthem. And all of a sudden, you say, oh, man. Job well done. Yeah. Mm -hmm. you know, the, the, Ray, the, the previous Olympics, 1968 in Mexico City, were, if people remember, that's where Tommy Smith and John Carlos, the track stars, famously yes, protested. They gave the black power salute when they were on the podium, and, and that caused all kinds of trouble. Um, in Munich, two other black stars twirled their medals and joked and, and refused to face the American flag when they got on the podium. Um, as an African, uh, 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 you know, you're from the Virgin Islands, but as a, as a black gold medalist, did anybody pressure you to make this uh, similar statement? No. No. See, I just turned 20. Mm -hmm. My parents were with me. Yep. And there it is. I wasn't alone, man. I was my parents was with me. What I needed, they provided, and I looked toward them for that. Be straight, mm -hmm. do the right thing, be honest, and, and don't forget to say thank you when you're done. Mm -hmm. That's it. Parents, that's man, it. parents, 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 mm -hmm. man, parents, and that's what happened, yeah. man. You know, I brought my mom and dad was separated. But I brought them back together for just that one special time. Mm. Together in Munich, Germany, and winning that Olympic gold medal. <laughs> Didn't believe I'd be the only one, but I knew I was going to be one. Mm. That's nice. Yeah, well, wait, I already knew that. I had, I had, listen, I had 350 amateur fights. I lost 12. Mm. Yeah, I heard that. 350 yeah. amateur fights, and I lost 12. That's, That's great. great. Come That's on. great record. You know yeah. something? In my professional record, it didn't show everything, but, the, you know, when you win a fight in somebody's hometown, they're not going to let you get away with that, so they scratch that off. You don't get I, – I, I went to a lot of hometown fights, man, in a lot of different places, and it didn't, it didn't register. I know today 
I know today the same words will come out of my mouth every day. I boxed 19 years. I had 430 fights. I lost 19. I had over 200 knockouts. Jeez. Yeah. Huh? Yeah. Did you hear me? That's impressive. Yeah. Come on, man. I'm trying to tell you. See, I had 80 pro fights. This said 60 something, but I had 80 pro fights. 70 wins, 7 loss, 3 draw, 46 knockouts. How can I run that down every day, every day for years? And then all of a sudden, it changed. Yeah. Like I said, when you go to another man's hometown uh, and you whip him, they're not going to write you down. Yeah. They're not going to do that, especially if, the, if it's a special guy. Man, I've been, <laughs> I've been every place and I've done that. But they, they, people, they're different. If you're not at home, they're different. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Ray, Ray, tell us this, though. When, when you won that gold medal, which was such an incredible accomplishment, and you came home to Tacoma with it, was there a parade? Was there an assembly at your old high school? Tell us that story when you came home with wait, the gold medal. We had a parade. We had a lightweight parade uh, in Tacoma, Washington, by giving uh, the date September 13th. Sugar Ray Seals Day, and it's it's solid. It's every year. I didn't, you know, something. I didn't make it this year because I had an eye doctor. I had an eye surgery. Yeah. I was wearing glasses. I'm legally blind. I had seven eye surgeries. I had four on my left and three on my right back then. Mm-hmm. And then all of a sudden, I wearing thick glasses up until uh, 35 days ago. I had an eye surgery on my right eye, and here's what's happening now, people. I don't wear glasses no more. Wow. Really? That's great. I don't wear glasses no more, man. That is oh, great. my God. That is fantastic. I'm, I'm living here in Indianapolis for 11 years, and I've been in the dark for 11 years. The glasses that I had, the bifocals that I had on, it wasn't telling me what needs to be told. Now, mm-hmm. now, I don't need them. This doctor, lived, this doctor, this this doctor Abrams, he took care of me. I mean, three hours laying on the couch there, and I held one of the nurses' hands for three hours. I knew I was out, but when 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 something when when she felt something wrong, she squeezed me, mm-hmm. put me back on where I'm supposed to be. Laid in for three hours, man, and then the next day when they took the patch off, I said, "Shit, dang you, me, hey." I was blind, man. I was in the dark for 11 years with glasses on. Yeah. What, was I, that got thumb, I got thumb, I got thumb in 1981. And then from then on, uh-huh. he just had problems. I was going to uh-huh. ask you if it was boxing damage that, that caused you to lose. Yeah, we fight. figured it was. Yeah, it was. I, I don't want I don't want to give the guy's name. I was in 1981 in Baton Rouge, Louisiana. I got thumb in the eye. Mm-hmm. I wanted to fight, not the guy over the top rope. I wanted to fight, but from then on, things change. Mm-hmm. When you mess with one eye, then the other eye is going to slow down or, or, or whatever. You know, so it's going to dim. So I've been in the I've been in the in the dim for a long time. In yeah. the dim. Yeah. The other day, before I had my surgery, I was walking to the gym. I walk in the gym, and it was so dark in the gym. I'm running into the to the. Uh, the heavy back. Matter of fact, I had an interview with Indiana Star, and they were right there with me. They watched me running into the bag, just walk, moving to, oops. I don't do it no more, and, and they haven't changed nothing. I just took my glasses off, and Dr. Abrams did what he's supposed to do with me, he helped me out. He gave wow. me my position back. What a miracle. <laughs> you, see, see you, the word you just said, a miracle. But miracles yeah. only come from upstairs, heaven. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay. You know, Muhammad Ali said to me in an autograph before he passed on, he said to the champ, because he called me the champ also, he said, service to others is the rent we pay for our room in heaven. So if you don't give, you don't get nothing. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And I've been giving all my life, man. I was a high school teacher for 17 years. I worked with the autistic program, autism, uh, teaching independence. And I was doing it, and I'm doing what the Lord wants me to do. He wants me to continue to give. He said, move in a man's or woman's hometown and share the word if they're listening stay. If not, dust yourself off and keep on moving. We become Johnny Appleseed. We planted one. <laughs> yep. nice. So that's where I'm at. That's nice. That's where I'm at. I'm here in Indianapolis. I've been coaching boxing now 10 years. Hmm. I've been in 11, but I've been coaching boxing for 10 years in two teams. And with those two teams, we have won 
nine Golden Glove Team Championships. Did you hear what I said? Wow. Nine. <laughs> I've been here 10 years, and, and, and we have won nine? That's great. I took a team. I took a team out of uh, third place two years in a row, and we first place five years in a row. Mm. I'm experienced. Yeah. Yeah, you're probably going to be a better coach now that you can see your kids. <laughs> uh -huh. Uh -huh. Now, now here's the deal. They're running after me now because I got vision. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. and with the vision comes knowledge and talent, man. And that's what I do. Pass it on the Lord. So you got to give, man. Ray, speaking Don't of coaching, give. Speaking of coaching, you came up through as an amateur through that Tacoma Boys Club, and we had Leo Randolph on this show a while back, and uh -huh. he he immediately credited you as everybody's role model at a club that produced not only Leo but Johnny Bumpus and Davey Armstrong and a lot of other guys. Uh, what what was special about that place? Joe Cloud, okay. the coach. Mm -hmm. He was there all the time, man. Here's what he did. He's a white guy. Mm -hmm. He gave up his wife and children. For us black folks. Mm. Mm. And then after he done that, we kicked him out of, of Washington. Mm. What do you mean? Well, because he was so on the black folks. Mm. They, they mixed, he, he, mixed, he mixed the relationship. Jeez. Mm -hmm. See, when he was one guy, he was a white guy, a heavy, super duper white guy, and all of a sudden he mixed. Well, that's because the team was all black, and we did that, so we pressured. Huh. We had our sister hanging out there, and all of a sudden, he fell in love with our sister, and he left his wife and children. Oh, but he became the best. He is the best coach that Tacoma has ever had. Hmm. The best coach, man. He had. He sent three fighters to two Olympics. Three fighters to two Olympics. One went twice, and we came back with two gold medals. And we talk about World Champ, you talk about Leo Randolph, Rocky Lockridge, uh, Danny Bump, City Bumpers, and all those other guys, man, those world champions. Yep. Yeah. Come out of downtown Tacoma, Boys, and nobody knew where Tacoma was. When you leave town and you ask where you're from, you have to say right outside of Seattle because nobody knew where Tacoma was. But we don't say no more. It's on the map. Yep. Mm -hmm. Look on that map. It's black, it's black letters that said Tacoma. We've done that. Boxers, Tacoma Boys Club, downtown Tacoma Boys Club, boxing team, we all put Tacoma on the map. Yeah. This is the Ringside Boxing Show from Monterey, California. I'm Dennis Taylor with John J. Responte. We are talking to former Olympic, actually not former, he is the Olympic gold medalist from 1972, Sugar Ray Seals. Uh, Ray, you yeah. won your first 21 fights as a pro. And then, then you fought Marvin Hagler, who was 14 and 0 in, uh, at the time, and that was in Boston. And you lost a really close, unanimous decision that night. So then you fight him to a draw in a rematch three months later in Seattle. Why were you such a tough matchup for Marvin Hagler in those fights? Uh, Southpaw, left-hander. It's, it's hard to fight left-handers. Way back in the old days, they said kill those guys, man, because nobody want to fight left-handers. They call them wrong-handers. Mm -hmm. uh, you see, right. and, and we was battling each other. You know something though, uh, my management that I had, we were supposed to wait on the second fight. We weren't supposed to fight right right away, but we thought something was going to happen there. We thought we could get him because when we fought the first fight, it was in Boston in a TV studio. Here's what happened: it was cold in the studio. I mean, it was freezing, and Marvin mm -hmm. Marvin had come out the dressing room sweating. <laughs> Did you hear what I said? Yeah. yeah, we was yeah. we was freezing in 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 the in the studio, and he comes out the dressing room sweating. <laughs> so we got beat. Mm. Uh, the people that I was with didn't understand. They didn't know by by matching champions with champions. They just went ahead. We took a fight. We never turned anything down. So we took a fight, and then and then after we lost that fight, we said, okay, we'll do it again, and we'll do it in our hometown which was Washington, but Seattle, hey, sometimes you have a hometown and sometimes you don't. It was a yeah. tough fight. I believe I won the first eight rounds. They only went ten, but it ended up as a draw. I understand that. Mm. But we have to live with that. And then yeah. the third fight, I had managerial problems, 
1979, I was the NABF middleweight champion, that's North American Boxing Federation middleweight champion, and the USBA, United States Boxing Association middleweight champion. I had both of those. And in order for you to get a shot at the world title, you have to take one of those from me. Mm -hmm. So in 1979, we went to Boston again. We just took the, here's what happened. We got hungry, but we needed the money. And we was told, if you don't take the money, we will take the belt, and then you won't get nothing. So we have to go and take something. So we went after the money, knowing that it's going to be a tough deal here because this is our third fight going against the same guy. And what happened? He switched on me. He went from left to right, and he caught me with a left hook. Hmm. And that was it. Well, you know, hey, man, you could see it. I wasn't there mentally. I wasn't even there physically. I was just there. Mm. They have to go through sugar ray seals in order to get to the next move. The next move. Yeah. I got a story for you. Okay. I was Vito Antifermo's sparring partner for six weeks mm -hmm. when he fought Marvelous Marvin Hagel to a 15 round draw. Really? Yeah. Wow. Remember that? Wow. Come on, man. He's my, he's my buddy today. Hmm. We was at Ring 10 a week or so, two weeks ago. And, and listen, they run me down and hug me and can't believe, man. Sugar man, what's that chap? I said, yeah, well, okay. <laughs> yeah, like, well, I'll take it. If that's the way you want to treat me, I'll take it, man. Yeah, yeah I, ain't, I ain't scared. I ain't got no shame in that. Because yeah. I know what I've done. We know what we've done. He's my mm -hmm. friend today. That's nice. You know something? Yeah. Craig Hogg, Craig Hulk is my friend too. Craig Hulk fought uh, Hector Macho Camacho in his day. He dropped Hector Camacho for the second time in Hector's career. He didn't win because it was Macho time. But yeah. we travel. But we travel. We go and meet greatness, man, and let them know that they're great. Evander Holyfield, Larry Holmes, uh, uh, Mark, I mean Mark Braylon, uh, uh, Spink, Michael Spink, and we all run into all them guys. We go chasing it. We jump in a car and drive away from here. We live in Indianapolis, but we going, man. We just came back from New York. We ain't fooling around. We want to be there to let them know that their greatness in our eyes and how we see them. Yeah. And at the same time, we'll get the same thing back. Because one hand wash the other and two hand wash the face. If you can't do it like that, it'll never work. Yeah, you, you met with Roberto Duran, right, New York? Uh, <laughs> right? Yes. I met with Ber Roberto Duran. I, I ran into uh, uh, Bernard Hopkins. Bernard Hopkins was going, we was in the casino, and he was going up the step on his way out, out the door. And someone hollered, Bernard, the sugar man wants to see you. He turned right, said, sugar man, and he ran right back down the steps, man, and we started to hug each other. It's like they knew me, like they know me. Mm-hmm. Everywhere I go, people know me. Oh, yeah. Come on. Now we have the Golden Gloves coming up October, October 13th. They're going to know me again. I ran into <laughs> Buster Douglas. I ran into uh, to, to, uh, my boy named uh, Ray. He, he won an 84 Olympic gold medal. Jerry Ray. I ran into all those guys. And then me and Marvin Johnson, we're the best of friends, man. Yeah. He was inducted Great into exactly. the Boxing Hall of Fame in May. The first so, Boxing Hall of Fame that Indianapolis, Indiana have. We just started that. Craig Hogg and myself and a few others. That's great. Yeah. That's great. Hey, that's Ray, I want to ask you man. about your, your, your second loss came a year later in Atlantic City against a tough Philadelphia fighter that we all remember named Eugene Cyclone Hart. Come on, man. Oh, man. What do you remember about that? Come on, tell hey, me. Hey, man, listen, what I remember about that, he hooked me in my hip. Mm. He hooked me with a left hook in my hip, and my leg raised up, and I ran for five rounds. I lost that. <laughs> I mean, he hit me hard. Yeah, you talking probably. about who hit you the hardest? Yeah, I thought it was Marvin Harris or somebody else. But this guy, man, he hit me with a left hook. And mm -hmm. my legs raised up and hit me. In the, boy, I tell you, and I ran. I, I limped for five rounds. Yeah. You so Eugene Hart was Hart. the hardest hitter that you ever yeah. faced? Yeah. Wow, yeah. no kidding. Yeah. Cyclone Hart. 
Eugene yeah. Cyclone Hearts, man. I fought a lot of them, man. I even fought uh, 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 what's some boy name out of here, out of here, uh, out of Indianapolis. Uh, man, he died last year too. Uh, he, he was a heck of a fighter too, man. I fought him twice. I fought him in Seattle. I stopped him in five rounds, and then I came back here in 1981, and I stopped him in five rounds. He was with Bob Chambers. Bob Chambers was his coach and those guys. And I knocked him out, man. They, it was unbelievable. But here I am in Indianapolis now, taking up from where he left off. Nice. Just moving. Just moving. Just moving. Just moving. Love the game, though, see. I'm a boxer. My dad was a boxer. I have three other oh. brothers. We always boxers together. So we learned. And then my mom, yeah. so she had the final tip. She had the final say there because she was there, too. She had the final say. Hmm. And every time she hollered in the, in, the, in the audience, I look. What's going on to my girl and I'm like, yeah, it's my boy, it's my boy. She beating up everybody. It's my boy. I said, oh, <laughs> sir. come on, mom. Let me win first. <laughs> yeah. Hey, and then when I fought the Bulgarian, I used the Kid Gavin and Bolo. Really? Shoot it on. <laughs> yeah, Kid Gavin and Bolo, man. And I shot it with the Bulgarian, and I dropped him. B Kid. for Bulgaria. The bolo punch. B for yeah. the bolo punch. Kid Gavilan, man. Yeah. Yep. Legend. I hurt you. I almost killed two guys with 10-ounce gloves. Wow. And then with the bolo punch. Lift him up off the canvas, drop him on the back, and then lay there for 20 minutes or so. Okay, let's talk about 1976 when you went to England and fought uh, the future world champion, uh, Alan Minter. Who was Alan Minter. British Again. Railway champion. Yeah, that Again. didn't end well, but he stopped you in the fifth. Now, what do you yeah. remember about that trip to England, and how good was Alan Minter? Hey, it, Alan Minter, was, he was a good for England. We was better, but we weren't uh -huh. prepared. We wasn't prepared, uh -huh. man. We took the fight because it was a trip. We're going overseas. It was a trip. I went to London, England. I went to Rome. I was in Denmark, Copenhagen, and I ended up in Johannesburg, South Africa. But it was a trip. So we took the trip. Didn't know. See, and here's the deal. Back in those days, you don't read up on this fighter or read up on that fighter. You just get yourself ready, prepared like you're supposed to, 100%. And then you go and you, do, you deal with what you're supposed to. And that's what happened. We just went over to London and, and, and ran into Alan Minter. And we was all by ourselves. There was three or four of us. We all by ourselves. We didn't have no backers. No backers, nobody. So, so we went to do what we, we wanted to do, hope that we could. We made a couple of mistakes. When I got knocked down, uh, 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 my coach said, stay down, and, and then we, and, and, and the time ran out. We got counted out, counted out when we were supposed to get up. So a lot of things happened. We learned, though. And we learned in order to, well, meaning learning is to pass it on to the next that is coming. Davey Armstrong, Leo Randolph, Johnny Bump, City Bumpers, Rocky Lockridge, those guys. They all mm -hmm. come out of the same boys club. I thank Leo for saying what he said. Sounds yeah, nice. thank Leo, man, for saying, hey, listen, I was, I didn't believe it, but I was the first, the first in Tacoma to win this, win that, and win this, and win that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And to keep on winning. So I had the winning on me. So if you fight with me, then you're going to win. If you do what we say, then you're going to win. And then we had a great coach, Joe Cloud. Mm-hmm. Super coach, man. Yeah. So, so just in a white guy, just to come into a black neighborhood and to do that in a black club, to be able to do that. You know, way back in the days, man, way back in the Ku Klux Klan days, I'd say this, because Joe was our leader. Way back in the hills in the Ku Klux Klan days, man, Joe, the white boy, was right up front, and none but a black team in the back. And we all marching down the yeah. road. And he was protecting us, man. Yeah. He led us, led us in and let us out. See, yeah, that's some moxie. Can't say much about Joe. Go ahead. Yeah. Ray, about four months after after that loss to Minter, um, you fought an undefeated southpaw named Ronnie Harris. And running, Ronnie, running, Ronnie, running, Ronnie. 
Okay. Run, he, that's he, it. He, we found in Madison Square Garden. He was a cutie then. Uh, yeah. Running yeah. Ronnie Harris, man. He beat him by hitting running. <laughs> I was going to ask we, you what went wrong in that fight. It, um, it was. We, we, didn't, we didn't understand it. See, here's, I'm, I'm going to tell you the same thing again. We don't never check the fighters that we go after. We just go after. Mm-hmm. We don't read up on nothing. Look at films. We don't do none of that. We just go in the gym and train and work our buns off, and then when time comes, we go and we handle our business. And that was our problem. That was our problem. Never paid attention to the opponents that we're dealing with. I went to New York and I fought uh, uh, Johnny Lo Cicero. Johnny Lo Cicero and Caveman Lee, they said, had one of the best first rounds in boxing history them time. Yeah. Remember that well. Oh, Come yeah. on, man. Now, here's the yeah. deal. When I went to see my eye doctor there in New York, they had the information that I had a bad eye already. Mm. Yeah, and they were trade. It was after that eye, steady going, going, going after that bad eye. Mm. But I beat the crap out of Johnny. I took care of him. I didn't come out of there. And then after that, they're telling you, and the word is out now, that he's cheating because he knows he knows he's blind and he's not telling nobody, and he's using this. Come on, man. There's nothing to do. You mm-hmm. and to read the eye chart. Every state don't have an eye chart. Every state has an eye doctor. They cover your eyes. They put the fingers in your face and wave again, and boom, you can see that. But now you got a chart. They put the lights on, and you got to read this and read that. Hey man, listen. Thirty-one days ago, or thirty-five days ago, when I had my eye surgery. <laughs> When the doctor took the patch off and he showed me some numbers, put my face in it, and I said, damn, man, I see all the numbers. I mean, the numbers were seeing me instead of me seeing them. Hmm. <laughs> yes. Yes, and that's just, man, listen, my boxing, I had a hell of a, te- uh, a, a career. I had a heck of a career, man. I've been all over yeah. the place. I met them all. Yeah. I met Rocky Marciano in 1968. He died in 69. Yeah. He wished me well. That's nice. I met Muhammad Ali in 68. And then we met in 77 when I, I was professional. We fought in the amphitheater in, in Chicago. He did a fire run exhibition. I went 15 with Doug Demings. 15 rounds. Back in the days, mm-hmm. man. It wasn't yeah. 1 to 12. It was, it was 13 or no. 15. That's right. The last, it was the last three rounds. If you ain't got the last three rounds, you ain't got nothing. Mm-hmm. That's where you lose, man. They don't count the first 10 or the first 12. It's the last three rounds. And you got to have, you got to fight the last three rounds like you start from the first. Yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> that was Sugar Ray, man. Me. Uh-huh. Ray Robinson's name? The Sugar Ray Robinson's name? His name is Walker Smith. Yeah. Right? Yep. It ain't Sugar Ray Robinson. It's Walker Smith. Walker right. Smith was standing behind. Sugar Ray Robinson was in front of Walker Smith, and Sugar got sick. Walker Smith stepped up in the in the shoe prints, and he became Sugar Ray Robinson. I don't know mm-hmm. how that happened, but he just took the name, and he became the greatest middleweight ever. Yeah, he was. He yeah, was greatest. Come on, man. And so we got the name. My name is Ray Seals, but Sugar goes with Ray. Uh-huh. The, other, the other, the other, the other, his name was Ray Leonard, and Sugar goes with Ray. Mm-hmm. We are so talking that. to Sugar Ray Seals on the Ringside Boxing Show. Hey Ray, I want to, I want to uh, go back to something you talked about just a, a little, little while ago. You became a school teacher, and you taught autistic kids for 17 years at Lincoln High in Tacoma. Um, that's a, that's a long career. You must have absolutely loved that. How was it teaching well, autistic kids? Well, I'll tell you something. It was the Lord's uh, choice. I was legally blind, man. Legally blind, but the Lord said, I got something for you. Blind or not, you don't need to do all that. You can just hang, and this is what you, you take care of these children for me. You can teach them, teach them what they need to learn, how to, how to be, be able to cook, clean, wash, and all of that stuff, independence, and how to help parents, because I took a lot of children and kept them over, over time and helped parents when they come home. We teach them the children to do exactly what you want them to do. 
clean, cook, sweep, make up the bed, I'm watching, put your clothes in the, in the dryer, and all of that stuff. And that's what, that's what made me the person I am today, because that was giving. For 17 years, I had to stand in there and do that every day, every morning, back and forth, and give. I had to take those children off the bus. Don't know how they're coming from home, but when you get to, get to school, you have to take them off the bus and control them right off the bat. It was tough. Hmm. It was tough. But I, I stunned it out, man. I hung it in there for 17 years. And I think the last three years, they didn't want me to, to retire as a full-fledged school teacher. So they stopped it at 17. That's what I'd say. But, hey, man, I was going good. Everybody was winning. Everybody was winning. They was learning. The family didn't care to send the children to school because they know who was going to be there, who that teacher is. Sugar Ray Sales. Mm-hmm. And not only that, but 1972 Olympics, you know what they called me in Tacoma? They called, they put, they said, he is one of the best uh, high school, uh, they, they put the name in there for me to, for everybody to realize that, yes, that guy did Sugar Ray Seals, man. He's great. I'm great in Tacoma, Washington. Mm-hmm. That's what I do. And not only mm-hmm. me, man, my mother. It came from my yeah. mother. Yes. She took care of eight children, four boys and four girls, in Tacoma, Washington, by itself. Wow, it was really? It was, is, come is she on, still alive? Is she still alive? No, she died about three years ago now. She's in heaven. Uh-huh. She's still alive up there. Yeah. Yeah. Because I feel her. Mm-hmm. And I know every time when she says something to me, I feel that. Like right now. She knows what I'm doing right now. Mm-hmm. So I feel her. And yeah. you know what she's doing up there? She's smiling. She said, she's saying, that's my boy right there. That's <laughs> my boy right there. You know, the other day, uh, the other day, Mark, Mark Breland's mama died. Mm. She passed. <clears throat> but mm-hmm. I texted him. And I said, listen, your mother and my mother is going to be up there together. They're up there together. And they're enjoying themselves. Don't you worry about nothing. You take care of yourself because they're doing fine. And he texted me back and said, thank you. Well, yeah. My mother got it going on, man. My mother is the real mother that everybody needs to be, to, to be, to look at and see how that happens. I'm telling you, she took her eight children, not only her eight, but then she took her other people's children. Wow. She was babysitting. She worked in a nursing home. I mean, she took care of the people in the nursing home. She gave. She worked in the food connection business. She gave food out. She took care of me. She went home with a bag, a lunch, and all that. She took care of all of that. She gave her life, man, for the next person. That's why we're here today. That's why we're doing the way we're doing. All of us are still living. Four boys and four girls. We're still living. Got a ton of children, grandchildren, and everything else. Yeah. Sammy Naismith. That's it. Oh, that's uh, right. Yeah. Yeah. Sam, right. Yeah. And Sam, Sam and Sammy Naismith. Here, this guy could have one foot in the graveyard and the next one on the banana peel and still drop the bomb on you. <laughs> <laughs> you hear me? Hey, hey, Ray. Yeah. You know what? We, you were talking about your mom. Well, I couldn't help but wonder. Do you have any kids and grandkids? And did any of them, if yeah. so, did any of them win a box? No, well, they want to, but I say I can't do it. You go yeah. How many do you get? How many kids do you have? I have. We have six. Really, three, six boys, kids. three boys and three girls. We have twenty grandchildren and one great grandson. Oh, yeah. oh. <laughs> that's sick! Oh my gosh! <laughs> it's it's listen, it's in the genes, man. <laughs> yes, <Yeah, so. laughs> yes, it is. Yes, but you. So I got to follow up, Ray. You said no boxing to them. No, they don't want, they want to, my one old son, he's a musician, and he does something else. My young one, they, they love what they do, man. You can't take them out of something that they, they involve and they love. You see, oh, sure, sure, everybody wants to be a boxer, see, but everybody don't want to get punched. Yeah. Mm. It's a lot safer being a musician, isn't it? <laughs> well, of course, <laughs> but, but listen, if you play that flute, all of a sudden your lips going to get messed up. Yeah. Or the, clar- or the clarinet, or even the trumpet. I used to play the trumpet in, in high school. In, in, in junior high and high school, I used to play the trumpet. But they're trying to put your lip in that little hole there, man, and, 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 and blow it out, and all of a sudden, and before you know it, you swole up lip. 
<laughs> but that's what comes with it. That's what comes with it, though. You got to expect that. It's not by itself. But boxing, you have to love it. It mm -hmm. has to become you. I teach boxing. I teach you two words. My two words is focus and listen. Focus on what you're doing and listen how to get it done. Two words. Mm -hmm. Your grandma and your mom used to slap you up and say, boy, you better listen to what I'm talking about. You hear what I'm talking about? And that's it. Focus on what you're doing and listen how to get it done. And that's why we're winning, man. Mm -hmm. Ten years going on 11, nine Golden Duck Team Championship. You can't beat that. No. Sure. No, come on, man. And, and it's hey, getting I, better now. It's getting better now. You know why? I can see you now. Uh -huh. Yeah. Hey, man, uh, be, being a 65-year-old guy, which is what I am, uh, i, I got to ask you one more question, because my very first favorite fighter was Emil Griffith. Oh, hey, 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 hold on. First in hold Iowa. on. Hold on. I, I swear, back in the, way back in the days, up until he died, I thought he was my cousin, my uncle. Mm -hmm. I, thought we was I thought we was related, man. We come from the Virgin Islands. Yep. Mm -hmm. even, Did you even know him? Living, he, he, yeah. Yeah, we come from the Virgin Even Livingstone Bramble. Mm -hmm. All right. And not only him, not only him, but Julian Jackson. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We're all from the Virgin Islands. The Cari we're Caribbeans. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, I, I just thought Emil Griffith was a very, a very special fighter. He was just yes, he was. Yeah, he was because because you know you know you know his personal problems, but he had to go through. Yep. Back then. To become mm -hmm. well known, exactly right. To become a legend, a hall of famer. Yep, yeah. he's greatness. He's greatness, man. Yeah, he is greatness. You guys remember Muhammad Ali said, "Service to others is the rent we pay for our room in heaven." So we got to yeah. keep giving. What you're doing today is you're giving because you're taking me and you put me out there for those people to see and to read and to understand who that guy is. And why, things like, and why things are happening like it is. Sugar Ray Fields was America's only gold medalist in boxing in 1972. Went on to win 57 fights as a pro. That's on on the record. He said he, he won some more uh, off the record. Uh, fought some of the great middleweights of his era. Uh, yeah. Ray, man, it's been a great pleasure talking to you today. Uh, thank you for thanking you for giving us uh, so much of your time on the Ringside Boxing thank you. Show. Hey, man, look, I appreciate it, man. Now, here, see, Thank you. see, when you come to me and to get my story, that's what happens. I like to get it out there, but nobody comes. See, but I'm here, like, like I said, I'm here 11 years, and my name is up there because of what my performance is done. Yep. Well, you hey, deserve it. We love giving you guys, you, uh, you, 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 yep. you deserve to be remembered. That's why, yeah, we're, that's why we're here. Thank you. I love Sugar it, Ray man. Seals on the Ringside Boxing right. Show. Thanks, Ray. Have a good one. Thank Take you care, very Ray. much. God bless you. Same to you. Same to you. Hey, do you yes, like this sir. podcast? Do us a solid. Tell your boxing friends about the Ringside Boxing Show. Post us on your social media and help us grow. Also, if you have not yet discovered the number one website in the world for daily boxing news, you got something to add to your bucket list. Uh, we update Ringside Boxing Show 365 days a year with all the hottest headlines and most interesting stories every single day. And if you're a hardcore boxing fan, this should be your first stop every morning and might be the only website you need to visit all day. Check it out right now and be amazed, ringsideboxingshow.com. Um, uh, thanks, as always, to our expert analyst, Travis Hartman, Rizwan Zahid, John J. Responti, our British correspondent, Paul McLaughlin, and, of course, another huge thanks to today's featured guest, Olympic gold medalist and former middleweight contender, Sugar Ray Seals. And, of course, thanks to all of you, Ringside Nation, for being a part of our worldwide audience again today. Keep your chin tucked, and we'll talk to you next week on the Ringside Boxing Show. Great day for me to whoop somebody's ass. Bad day for to get off my back with my neck cold cock. You cross my path. It's a great day.